Hi, everybody. It's Rob Shapiro from In the Mind of. Had the opportunity and the honor to talk to Jacqueline Olivier. Jacqueline is a massage therapist who I met about 40, well, she's not even either 40 years ago, but she's been you know, doing the over 40 years, probably a little bit more now from the website said 40, but I bet it's a little bit more. Uh, the creative neuromuscular reprogramming. And she uh, right now is the owner of the clinic, um, the Hillis Neural Rehab Clinic, which is in Mill Valley, which is a beautiful place to visit. And I kind of met Jacqueline over the years, probably, I can't think how many years ago now, I had looked into taking some courses and went online and talked to some other people who had taken her work and they said how amazing she was and as a person and as a, an educator and the system that she developed. So I have the, this is a great opportunity for me to kind of introduce, if you haven't ever met her before, into our PT. It's my goal is to, you know, she's doing what she's doing in, in her world. She's now a, you know, a master person in the massage world, made a Hall of Fame recently, congratulations. And then, you know, the goal is to have her, you know, in the physical therapy world. Um, what did I miss? Thank you. Welcome. Thank you again for coming. Yeah. But what did I miss? Sure. I don't Oh, I don't know that you missed anything other than, you know, 70 years of lifetime that you just barely see a little bit of. But um, yeah. I'm, I'm delighted to be speaking to the physical therapy world because it has been for decades now my strongest desire to get this work into the hands of physical therapists where it belongs because my experiences and I see a lot of clients in my clinic who are working with physical therapists and the piece that neuromuscular reprogramming brings to the equation is something that they don't get from their physical therapy experience. You know, not, I don't, it's what I do is by no means a replacement for physical therapy. You know, I'm always delighted to collaborate with my physical therapy colleagues whenever they're open to uh, incorporating a new point of view and um, I believe physical therapy gets better results when this one little missing piece gets in a, put into the process of re-educating the body. We call let's it. Go back, let's go back and yeah, let's go back and tell everybody what neuromuscular reprogramming is to kind of give a definition and kind of describe it a little bit to the, the newbies. Exactly. So we, we came to call it neuromuscular reprogramming because it, in, in, in three words, explains what it does because it, it actually is capable of re-educating very quickly our body's ability to get messages through to all the parts of the operating functional motor coordination system that are normally stored in the cerebellum. We learn how to do things. Some of the things that are uh, that we that we do come with the body. They're part of the hard wiring of the computer, so to speak. But a lot of the things that we do are things that we developed and learned over a lifetime. And when accident and trauma happen to a physical body, there may be tissue damage, but there's also collateral damage in the information system that runs the show. So that's the piece that. In fact, uh, we, we have a, a, a preconception in physical therapy that this can be re-educated by activity, and certainly activity is a necessary part of it. But if you're trying to re-educate some part of your body that you've lost control over because it was actually damaged for a period of time and off the map, when you start to exercise it, it is the least available neuromuscular pathway. So to, if you can do something, if you can re-interact with the body in a way that makes it apparent that the synapses in the chain between, I want to make this movement where I'm lifting my arm now, if you can't lift your arm with your deltoid, and you've gotten into the habit of lifting your arm by engaging the extensors in the back of your neck and your thorax, you will always lead with the back of your neck and your thorax. Even if you work with discipline to not do that because you've got a kinetic chain that's programmed into the cerebellum where you have a default sequencing that's gotten stored over time and we can't get in there and reprogram that unless we actually experience that the muscle's failing 
And if we can lift our arm, we don't experience that it's failing. We don't realize we're making that lift with the wrong muscles. So, right. so how does neuromuscular programming do? Like, what's the tools? What do, you, what do you use? What's the tools that we use to determine programs, right. so to speak? Well, when you muscle test, which is to say, if you ask a muscle, like your deltoid, to work against a little bit of resistance, and it's not a strength test, it's just an activation of a neurologic or neuromuscular connectivity. If you ask a muscle to work, the less you ask it to do, the more likely you are to perceive that it doesn't have the connections in order to match that amount of activity. So before you engage a substitution, you can have a conversation with a muscle that's failing. And in that moment, you can actually Mm, it becomes a learning moment, it becomes an opportunity for your body to uh, get curious, to be interested in innovating a potentially a new uh, strategy, shall we say. So um, the goal of neuromuscular reprogramming is to find those uh, disabled links in our kinetic chains and to uh, discover what is inhibiting them or what is dominating them. So in the case of, uh, you know, kinetic chains, it's there's some other part of the chain that's doing all the work. Or in the case of reciprocal inhibitions, it might be developing too much tension on the opposite side, or it might even be in a synergistic relationship with the rest of the compartment that it has to moderate its movements because it goes, you know, in a branch of many different fibers. It has many different directions that it can be modulating its movement. So all these different ways your body has of then uh, eliminating, or shall we say, um, narrowing the expression of what that muscle group is capable of doing. Right. So now you look at somebody on the table or you, as they're moving, you look at some quality of motion and you put them on the table, you might do some movement testing and then you'll decide to do a, a muscle test. Let's say something comes up inhibited, not able to activate. What's the next step? How do you know what to, what to do next? Well, you know, there's a, there's a lot of uh, palpation involved. There's a lot of uh, understanding of the body's biomechanics involved, you know, where our, but palpation will tell you where the, um, where the consistent over-efforting is going on which is frequently your compensation or your default that you're using as your initiative in moving. So you can, you can go to an area like that and then you can actually muscle test the muscle that was weak a moment ago, right? So if you're exploring, you know, let's say somebody's shoulder, easy to talk about, nice and complex, layers deep of problems that can be going on with the shoulder joint. Um, and if your body has come up with um, mm, compensations for muscles that aren't working properly, then once you identify the muscles that aren't working properly, you can actually see if adding a little therapeutic advantage or interrupting a muscle that's dominating or taking over for the muscle that was missing. So let's say hmm, your posterior deltoid has taken over for uh, the function of your infraspinatus muscle. So they're synergistic, they're back there, they're working together, they should be sequencing, but post delt has taken over. The, the point of the shoulder is being pushed forward in a way that doesn't allow full um, settling of the head of the humerus in its position in the glenoid. So your, um, your, body is always in a position where that certain where that muscle is many of the muscles in the shoulder are disadvantaged so if i do a little therapy on the posterior deltoid will the inhibited muscles get better so i can just touch and test it's one way uh, we call it therapy localizing um, generally i do it through palpation just because in moving the body around and feeling the tissues i can pretty much zero in on what your what your body is doing instead of using right. the muscle right so if the front of your shoulders so you would we'll see the neck get involved for instance 
So right. it's not just in the shoulder. It can be wired all the way into the core of your body. It can be uh, your, your extensors on the opposite side that are making these inhibition patterns. And so there's a certain right. developed understanding of where the problems are being compensated from that enables you to quickly get down to it. So the, the simple component, so if I found a muscle that was weak and I would find the other muscles that are facilitated and then release those, is that a, right? So I find the muscles that are overworking for that inhibited muscle, do my work and then retest it and then act, then use it functionally. There's the, you know, the components of it to bring it into practice. Right, right. yeah, you have to put the body through an exercise of being able to repeatedly use a sequencing of muscles in order for it to be confident that it now has access. So, right. yeah. So that's the interesting part. A lot of time you'll see physical therapists will palpate something, it's, it, all of a sudden it's tight, let's just stretch it. And uh, you, know, what if, you know, my concern has always been, and you know, talking to you over time, that what if that muscle is holding on for dear life, so to speak? Yeah, you know, right. if I'm in a poor posture, my levator is tight, but if I make, if it's, I tested it, maybe test that weak, there's other muscles that might be working so hard. It's not, it's, you know, now the elevator is trying to compensate. So yeah. we got to make sure we're not always palpa you know, the muscles that are tight, but we do our muscle testing and figure out patterns. Is that Must clear? Be. Yes, it is. Um, so, so the complexity of it begins to be realized when you look at things that are tight because our logic says, Oh, it's tight. It'll feel better if we release it. But if that thing is tight because it's weak, and this is in fact what the body does with, um, with muscles that aren't facilitated, hamstrings are an excellent example of that, where you've got a kinetic chain running through your low back and through your glutes and into your, ha into your hamstrings. And if the hamstrings are inhibited and the back extensors have taken over, then every time you wanna use a hamstring, you're gonna get excess tension in your low back. And as the excess tension in your low back persists, you're gonna have a persistent inhibition in your hamstring, but the hamstring gets tight. And a lot of clients will tell you, I have tight hamstrings and I'm, you know, I'm stretching them every day, but they just don't stay stretched. Well, that's because your body's right. intelligent and it realizes that a long, relaxed hamstring is not very useful to you because that hamstring is inhibited and won't be very responsive when you need it to be part of your movement patterns. So it holds it in a state right. of restriction. So levator scap is perhaps not so common as far as a weakness goes because levator scap is usually holding everybody together. But it's true, even levator scap with its many branches can have certain branches of its function that aren't as, as functional as the others. Right. So how do you do with coursework? How did you develop it? Because I know you have, we have NMR, one, two, three, four, advanced, like where do they come up? And you know, what I liked about the system is that it kind of, it, it can be so confusing in general, because like, where do I start? Where do I start? And okay. what you did well is, you, you know, mod one has, the, how'd you come up with those patterns? Ah, well, you know, um, it was actually a challenge. Somebody in, in Mexico wanted me to come down to Mexico and teach NMR. She happened to be uh, engaged to a very long-standing client of mine. So she, and she was a body worker. So she hatched up this idea. So I said, okay, cause that was an excuse to go to Mexico and relax and have a good time. And I went down mm -hmm. there. Uh, but I was thinking, what would I teach that I could feel uh, uh, responsible to handing over a piece of information that wouldn't harm because when you start changing somebody's motor coordination strategies and you don't have a strategy in mind, you don't have an integrated right. endpoint in mind, you can leave somebody with instability that will leave them vulnerable to injury. So that was my primary. Right. So I, I, uh, we started with stabilizing hips and low back and abdominals. And when you put that piece together, you have your foundation. And on top of that foundation you know, are your shoulder functions. 
You know, and then lately I've started thinking about the whole thing as if it was in a good old fashioned car where you've got that drive train that goes right down the middle underneath and mm -hmm. then branches out to the wheels and then it translates the torque. And then you got all this action going on in the wheels that are, you know, able to do these extraordinary things. But if it weren't for the integrity of the spinal column and all right. the muscles that attach and stabilize from that, you wouldn't be able to do all the fine motor um, detail that comes in the expression right. of our limbs, right? And the strength of our limbs. So that was how it all came together. So just uh, mod one mm -hmm. became the hips, low back, abdominals. Let's get it stabilized right there at the base. And mod two became the integration of the rear wheels and the, and the, and the front wheels of the car. And then the next one was to make sure that the whole forward back flexion extension sequencing from top to bottom works. And by that time we know enough to actually begin working with the neck, which is a pretty tricky uh, piece of equipment to muscle test. You can do a lot of harm muscle testing somebody's neck and um, very right. cautious. For me, muscle testing, I also have to remind people constantly, it's not a test of strength. It's a test right. of neuromuscular responsiveness. Are you able to hear me when I, when I ask you to work, if I give you five pounds of challenge, can you give me five pounds of resistance? And if you want right. to use momentum, or if you want to hold your breath and make a special effort, I know that that muscle isn't working. You're already giving me signs and signals. You know, if you're looking up to the right while you do it, I know that you're engaging your suboccipitals and your eye muscles to think of right. you know, somebody who could possibly help to make a muscle work. Right. Well, uh body has many, many well, I'll try to do it yeah I'll try to do it like clinic wise like early as connectivity can they find it once they find it then we start to do the strength and all the stuff that we're normally I think what happens is physical therapists is we skip from the motor right to the strength and we lose some of that motor control part we kind of miss that component of it so that's where NMR to me and right. realizing hey once I have them that connectivity then I gotta get them stronger once I get them stronger then I have to get more power so it's a whole matter of you know building a building a little pyramid where it kind of works from the bottom up it also works in layers because you want the big muscle support before you start taking apart the sometimes the smaller muscles have taken over let's say in the function of the shoulder you get infraspinatus and some of the muscles in the back and the subscap you get those muscles taking over for for some of the big things in your body that don't work so your infraspinatus right. and the series minor will get involved when your traps aren't working and they'll start right. bracing the initiative of, of stabilizing the back of your shoulder because you've got a scoliosis pattern in your spine and that particular shoulder doesn't have big muscle support because there's some deviation right. that's creating some predictable, very predictable set of inhibitions. Right. So in the time of, you know, while we're recording this, the coronavirus component of it, what are you doing teaching wise? What are you able to do or uh, what do you have coming up? <laughs> well, you know, everything was uh, brought to an abrupt halt, right? I never had mm -hmm. anything quite, quite so startling. Um, uh, so we're going to put Mod 1 that was supposed to be taught all over the country. We're going to put it on live streaming on Zoom on June the, mm -hmm. the 5th through the 7th. It's going to okay. have a, a, a scheduling that would be unusual for it because usually we run it from Friday evening through Sunday, but we'll be um, figuring out what scheduling enables the uh, people on the East Coast and the West Coast and maybe even the people in Australia to join in the greatest number of people. Right. But I think actually it's going to be full just with our, our, um, uh, our interest list here from, from the United States because it's already starting to to fill up. So uh, if anyone's interested right. to get involved in that, they can certainly find it on <clears throat> our website, neuromuscular-reprogramming.com slash events. And there's a whole calendar there of whatever's upcoming. I'm just beginning to reschedule things that had to get canceled throughout this spring and summer. Right. How will that work? How are you gonna, are you gonna have Tell people to pair up or it'd be interesting, right? Yeah, uh, preferably people would find another colleague 
who was interested in learning the material because that's the best learning opportunity. If you grab a family member, you don't quite have the same conversation um, or opportunity. Right. Um, also, depending on family dynamics, <laughs> you may you may be having a lot of challenge uh, because muscle testing is something that is fraught with subjectivity and um, and energy dynamics. You can you can be very inaccurate. People people criticize muscle testing because it's uh, it's so easy to do it wrong. So you can you can override. You can use will, you can fail to notice. Uh, so you, you can get, one person will get a different set of results than another person gets. Right. So it's one of those things where you have to just admit it's, um, it's a subjective art that is relevant right. as, as an assessment tool. And it actually, because just the whole interaction with asking your body to do things that are very specific it enables your body to feel itself in a way that it would normally not be paying attention, right? right? When we're just moving, we're not listening to where the movement is coming from. So muscle testing is helpful even if it's not accurate. It's even going to change right. the way you get the results. If you simply test everything, your you know, client comes in complaining that their shoulder isn't working. If you muscle tested everything you knew how to muscle test in their shoulder, or you just made up a bunch of muscle tests and you just gave them a little bit of something to um, experience themselves from the inside out, and then you went and did your therapy, you'd get a different result with the therapy, even so, without any organization or logic. The body itself has organization and logic and intelligence. And so the more information you give it in the form of sensation, the better result you get from your therapy. Right. That's an interesting part of learning, you know, learning from you, the, the, there's a science and there's the art and you could, you know, I remember being, being in some classes and testing somebody and they tested out strong and then you or somebody else came along and said, well, a little distraction. Yeah. Watch what they did. As soon as you did that, they put their eyes up or they use their, you know, they're masters to make that motion happen. So it's a lot of it. It's one thing to learn muscle testing, but to learn and, you know, be able to integrate is, is a whole different, whole different world. But uh, anything else? We're going to probably close up here in a few minutes. Anything else you want to say to everybody? And... Um, I, well, the results, right? So I think of neuromuscular reprogramming as a very simple tool that anybody could learn. But what makes it not so simple is that the body's not simple. The body has layers of compensations and problems. It has a lot of stored information that has happened over a, the course of a lifetime. Kids, you can get results really fast. You can turn the whole right. ship around in one half hour session. Adults who are in their 50s and 60s, it's, a, it's a, like deconstructing a, a a building with a with a hammer and a chisel uh, so you have to have a strategy that leaves the body in a good place every time and you have to understand that it's not over quickly necessarily because the client would like a quick a quick result but frequently by the time they're experiencing symptoms they're deep down a long path that led to the symptom that they're experiencing right now and you you get to see that and that's part of the educational process in interacting with your clients to let them know one they've got to do some work from the inside out and two this is not a quick fix because they've got layers of problems going on and everything's connected to everything so like i said initially i think you know nmr is such a good combo with pt it's like they're made you know their husband wife you know they, they belong together so i'm they, looking forward to Helping you out any way I can, and uh, looking, I always enjoy learning from you and seeing you. This is nice. It's been a, you know nice for me to actually see you. I haven't seen you for a while, so it's good to see yeah, you I in know. person. Well, thanks for having me on. All right, we'll talk soon. Thank you. This is uh, Rob Shapiro from In the Mind of.